Uh, I grew up in Brooklyn and Queens, New York. I was a city kid. So I went to a Catholic elementary school. I was an altar boy. I did all the right things <laughs> that I was supposed to do. Uh, my, my father was, um, I'll just say, very disciplined, very strict. Uh, every night we did my spelling words, we did math. He was a math wizard and as a result of that I became real strong in math and eventually that helped me a great deal. My high school counselor called me in one day and uh, said, there's this new school that's out in the West that uh, would like you to uh, have a look at it, see if you'd like to become a candidate. I asked them what that was all about. I took all the tests, went home, never thought a thing about it. And then eventually I got this letter in the mail that said, you're a candidate, you've been accepted. And I thought, oh, I better find out more about what this is about. I had no idea what I signed myself up for. My first roommate wanted to be an astronaut and a bunch of the other guys wanted to be pilots and fighter pilots and I didn't know what the hell I wanted to be, to be honest with you. <laughs> and there I was amongst all of them. Decided to study civil engineering, which turned out to be a very good choice for me. Uh, and then had a great four years. Got a great education. Have the closest of friends uh, from the time I was there in terms of classmates, and et cetera. Uh, yes, absolutely great decision. Uh, I learned that um, becoming a mentor to help other people was very important because a lot of people mentored me. And, and I wouldn't have had the success I had in my career and my life without all those mentors, a whole bunch of them. So as graduation approached, um, we started to go through the process of what are you going to do next? I was pilot qualified. I had also applied for some scholarships for advanced degrees. And I got a call from the head of the Department of Civil Engineering at Oklahoma State University. And he said, Oklahoma State University would like to offer you a scholarship uh, to come here and study for three years and get a PhD. And I said, wow, PhD, holy mackerel, that's a big deal, right? So I went in, we had an advisor and he said, no, no way you can go to school for three years. He said, I'd have to get that approved at the Pentagon. I called this head of the department back and I said, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I have to turn down your offer because the Air Force won't approve me coming to school for three years. He said, okay. Calls me back in about a week and he said, I have another offer for you. Uh, I've arranged with Phillips Petroleum here in Oklahoma to uh, provide a scholarship for you to get a master's degree. So we'll give you a scholarship for two years. So. Um, I go off to Oklahoma State University. I got married in, in March of that year. I get the degree, I graduate, off to my first assignment, Lockbourne Air Force Base in Ohio. And about uh, seven or eight months out, before my magic date in the summer of 71, I get an assignment to Vietnam. And now I gotta think about it. So I think to myself, you know what? The Air Force Academy was really great to me. My time in the Air Force has been really great. I owe. I owe the country. I owe the Academy. I owe. I gotta go. I went off to Vietnam and uh, I never regretted it. It was a good decision. It was a turning point in my life. Because at that point, I thought far more seriously about staying in the Air Force. My, my plan was do my time in Vietnam, come back uh, to the US and separate, basically. While we were at Lockbourne, we had our first child. And he was born uh, with a serious uh, stomach disorder. And the way the squadron rallied around me and brought food, told me to take time off, all that stuff made me think, why would I not want to stay in this outfit? While I was in Vietnam, I had time to fill out all the paperwork and do what I needed to do to apply to, for a professional engineer's license. Came time to go home and uh, they asked me where I wanted to go and I said, uh, you know, I'd like to get 
closer to my family, which was all still in New York. Uh, so I picked Andrews Air Force Base. But now I want to go to Andrews Air Force Base. No Andrews Air Force Base. Pentagon right next door, right? When you went in there, uh, within the first week or so, uh, you met the two-star, who was the Air Force civil engineer. He said, well, what job did we give you? And I said, I'm supposed to rewrite the manual for industrial engineering in the Air Force. And he said, oh, that'll be good. I said, but here's the only problem. I've never been in industrial engineering in the Air Force, but I'll learn it, not to worry. About an hour later, I get a call from his exec, who's a full colonel, and I start getting my ass chewed. He says, who do you think you are telling the general that we put you in a job that you weren't correct for, whatever? And oh, by the way, you're moving to the housing division, and I got really good experience doing that, but I was back in housing construction <laughs> in spite of the fact that I'd shot my mouth off. So I did my thing in the housing division. They sent me to squadron officer school. I went to squadron officer school, did pretty well at squadron officer school. I was a distinguished graduate. I get back to the Pentagon, and my job was to help him prepare for the congressional hearings. Five and a half years it turned out to be an assignment working for, for four different two stars, all of whom I learned something different from. All the stuff that fit into my background and added to what I needed to know later, I'll say my success, and eventually getting to the same place. We get an assignment to be the operations officer in the Civil Engineering Squadron at Grissom. Truck comes, pack our stuff, on its way to Grissom. I get another phone call from the Civil Engineering Office at the Pentagon. Gene, uh, your assignment has changed. I said, what do you mean? My stuff's on a truck. It's going to Indiana. My wife's going to flip out. You're going to be rerouted to McConnell Air Force Base. The uh, base civil engineer at McConnell was going to retire. So I was being sent there to be the ops chief, knowing that they were going to move me up to take over the squadron. Again, it was a great assignment. And then I went from there to the Industrial College of the Armed Forces, off to the Europe, to Ramstein for a three-year tour at Ramstein that eventually lasted five years. Um, <laughs> but it was great. And uh, General Ahern went to him, to the four-star, and proposed that he give me an opportunity to be the wing commander at Ramstein. And um, four-star agreed. And it was the first time ever that they let a civil engineer be a wing commander. So here I was, had a civil engineering group under me, had a security police group under me because we had nuclear weapons, we had a nuclear squadron, two army squadrons of security policemen, two air force squadrons, had responsibility for Kaiser Slaughter military community, the largest community of Americans outside the U.S. I had the chaplains, I had the lawyers, and boy, I'm like drinking out of a fire hose. Then I headed back to the States from there. Uh, I became the Civil Engineer Strategic Air Command. But, but again, it turned out to be a great assignment. I worked for a four-star there who was uh, very supportive and a very tough boss. Some of the brightest people in the Air Force uh, got together and decided that it was time to reorganize. That SAC effect would go away. I had to make sure that everybody was placed and everybody was taken care of. Some went to the new Air Mobility Command, some went to the new Air Combat Command. That was really important to me to take care of those people because they had really supported me very, very well. I would gotten my first star. At Air Mobility Command, I get notified one day that I need to go to Osan, Korea to have a meeting with General Ron Fogelman. Phil Ford and I are told, come to, Ram come to Osan. The reason I called you two guys here is because I need you to get something done. Okay, he said, you can't tell anybody this. I'm fortunate enough that I'm gonna get my fourth star and become the commander of Air Mobility Command. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna fix up that whole command. You, Gene Lupia, are gonna make that happen. Yes, sir, thank you. You, Phil Ford, are gonna get Lupia all the money he needs. And everything I needed, literally everything I needed, he supported. He was an amazing boss. Amazing boss. When he did my efficiency report in the block he had to fill out, he wrote one sentence. 
San Lupe to Washington with me. As a result of that, I got my second star and went to the Pentagon and became the Air Force Civil Engineer. That was a heck of a job, let me tell you. I had a lot of responsibility, I had a great staff, but I had the responsibility for basically 65,000 people in Air Force Civil Engineering, $6 billion worth of resources for the housing program, the environmental program, for all the construction programs, etc. It, it was just a fantastic job. Very busy, had my hands full, um, but I really enjoyed it and I had great support from the chief. <laughs> I retired in 99. I was in the position four years instead of the three. I had eight offers to go out to different companies. And one of the offers was from a company called CH2M Hill. People were so nice and so warm. They were trying to recruit me. I figured that out. But they were really, really nice people. I said, you know what? I'm going to accept the offer from them. And that's how I got to CH2M Hill. I get a call from a guy uh, who I had met during the interview process who's going to be my boss. Gene, I know you got an extensive background in the environmental business. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about taking over the environmental business for the firm. While I'm in the air going to Denver, they released the announcement that I'm taking over as president of the environmental services business in the company. <laughs> but I get in Ferris's office at like 8 or 9 o'clock the next morning and say, Sir, I came to talk to you about the job you're thinking about putting me in. He said, not thinking about it. I released the announcement last night while you were in the air. That's how I got that job. I do have a lot of pride. I think I made significant contribution uh, to the country. I'm very proud of that. Uh, significant um, contributions back to my alma mater. Tried very hard. When I first started trying to help with the foundation and the construction programs and such, it was a little bit of, hey, I kind of owe you to do this. And now, it's not that anymore. Now it's a labor of love. I love helping out with our projects and making them successful. Oh, distinguished graduate, I used the word flabbergasted. I was flabbergasted, and quite frankly, I'm very honored. It's just, it's an unbelievable group of people. So to be one of them, being sort of admitted into the club, I was very proud when I got into the National Academy of Construction. There was 25 people that were brought in in a year. It was two or three a year. So it's, it's very hard to comprehend how important, it, not important, but how meaningful it is. Well, I, I go back to uh, thanking my parents. That, you know, they really laid the foundation. As I told you, my dad was a bit of a taskmaster, but he made sure I knew how to spell, he made sure I knew how to do math, and he was a, he was a great dad. He took very good care of the family. So I, I certainly thank them. My wife, 54 years, she's put up with me. <laughs> I do mean put up with me for 54 years, so I give her a lot of the credit. My children have been just great children. They gave us four wonderful grandchildren so my family has you know been around me all the time I owe a successful career in the Air Force successful career in industry and sort of a successful consulting business <laughs> I do it for fun mostly but in any event uh, it's just because I you know I've gotten old enough to reflect on the fact that I would not be there if it hadn't been for the Air Force Academy